All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we've got everyone, please take your seats. Uh, we're going to move on to our second panel of today. Hello, my name is Brian Whedon. I'm the Director of Program Planning uh, for Secure Row Foundation. Uh, and uh, for the next hour, we are going to be debating whether it should be called space traffic management or space traffic control or space traffic coordination. Nobody wants to talk about that? I'm going to be a fascinating subject. We're actually, hopefully, not going to do that. Um, but we are going to spend the next uh, uh, period of time talking about what is going on uh, with the topic of space traffic management, which is my preferred uh, term to call it. This is something that's been debated in academic circles for decades, but really didn't become a salient public policy issue until uh, 2010, uh, when the Obama administration quietly started the, a formal interagency working group to talk about wh what the United States should do on space traffic management. Um, they met privately and quietly over the next six years and laid some of the key foundations we'll talk to in a minute, um, but did not reach a conclusion on what space traffic management would look like. It did become uh, a very public issue in June of 2018 when the Trump administration announced Space Policy Directive 3, which was the first US national policy on space traffic management. Um, and it made the Department of Commerce the focal point for space traffic management. But it also kickstarted a renewed international discussion on what the proper approach should be and the balance between national efforts and international efforts. And, and that debate also included activities in Europe. Uh, and just in the March of this year, the European Union um, announced their approach and their strategy to space traffic management, um, which is billed as being somewhat different from the US approach. So what we're going to be talking about over the course of this panel is how this issue of space traffic management has evolved over the last several years, um, what the right balance is between national level, national level efforts, international efforts, um, do we need multilateral agreements, can things be done voluntarily, what is the role for industry, what is the role for standards, how do we get to something like a coherent space traffic management regime. So I'd like to welcome the, our distinguished panelists that will be joining you for this discussion. Um, starting on my far left, uh, Rodolfo Munoz. He's the legal officer for the European Commission within the Directorate General for Defense, Industry, and Space, where he works on space policy issues, including space traffic management. Next to me, Dr. Mario Borowitz, assistant professor in the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs at Georgia Tech. Her research deals with international space policy issues, including international cooperation on Earth observing satellites, satellite data sharing, uh, and also space security and space situational awareness. Next to me, uh, we have Brian Twelling. He's an innovation boffin. Love that, love that, it's great. Uh, at Exoanalytic Solutions, one of the leading commercial space situation awareness providers. Uh, Brian does theoretical and applied research and advanced modeling of the space domain to enhance space situational awareness. And on the, my far right is Ardi Halamani. She's the Secretary General of the Global Satellite Operators Association, a trade association representing 28 global and regional satellite operators. She works with her member CEOs to lead the effort to showcase the benefits of satellite communications for a more inclusive and secure society. Uh, now I'm going to mention up front that we, we, we don't have someone on the panel uh, representing the U.S. government. Um, the new face of space traffic management in the U.S. government is Richard Dalbello, who was recently announced as the new director of the Office of Space Commerce. Uh, Rich was unable to be here in person, but he will be giving a virtual keynote following lunch. So with deference to Rich, um, I'm going to try and fill in some of the details of current U.S. policy where I can. 
Uh, and if I say something uh, opposite of what Rich says, just ignore me and please go with whatever Rich says. Uh, as a reminder, as we did with the first panel, we're gonna be using the Whova app for questions. Um, and the key here is to go back to the list of sessions and then go into this session. Uh, because if you drop questions into the previous session, I'm probably not gonna see them. So please make sure that you transition over to the session on space traffic management, uh, drop in your questions, go to the ones in there, and I'm going to work those in as best I can throughout our discussion. Um, so, Mariel, um, to get us started, uh, I mentioned the Space Policy Directive 3 that was issued in 2018 as the first U.S. policy on space traffic management. Um, can you kind of just give a general overview of what it laid out and what sort of the big things in there that it decided? Sure. So I would say that actually a lot of what's in SBD 3 uh, is more on the space situational awareness side uh, than necessarily getting into to space traffic management. So a lot of it talks about one, this transition from managing SSA capabilities on the military side and transitioning that over to a civil agency, uh, which we are still in the process of, of trying to make happen. Uh, so there's that transition. There's also an assurance in there that the U.S. will continue to provide a, uh, you know, free access to collision warnings or conjunction warnings uh, for, for objects in space. So, so to continue to do that analysis and make that freely available for all users. Um, although again, you know, this is something where the details of exactly what that'll look like, what level of quality, that's something still being debated. Um, let's see, what, I think those are, the, those are the two really big uh, things that are in there. And then there's you know, all sorts of detail about um, other information that, that could be collected, that could be shared, uh, working with other nations. So the idea that we need to have uh, international cooperation is, is mentioned in there. Uh, but I think those are the kind of the key elements. And I think it also mentioned that when it comes to creating space traffic management rules, and I'll use that, that word in quotations, we'll talk about that as we go along, uh, they were going to base that on industry-developed standards, right, and best practices, uh, which, was, uh, which is, is, is uh, a, a strategic choice, right? So instead of the government dictating how to do things, they were looking to what industry was doing and sort of had said, this is our standardized way, yeah. Um, so, Rodolf, um, back in February this year, the European Union issued a joint communique outlining its strategy on space traffic management. Um, can you talk about what was in it and, and sort of what is the, 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 you know, emerging as the European approach on STM? Yeah, of course. Um, so first, thank you for uh, the Secure World Foundation for inviting us. Um, this, uh, indeed, this STM communication is a joint communication between uh, the Commission and the EAS uh, because, indeed, the idea of this communication was exactly to try, because, of course, it's not perfect, but to try to have an holistic approach. Uh, we try to bring together all the elements linked to space traffic management. And indeed, we face exactly what you said. How do you define space traffic management? It was a nightmare because, of course, and this is normal, at the commission level, we listen member states in this field very carefully. So we had to discuss what do you have in mind. And when you put, uh, I mean, uh, when you look for a definition, the definition will vary according to whom you will ask that question. If you ask to an engineer, to a lawyer, to a scientist to a political scientist to a diplomat, it will have a different definition. So here, what we try to do is to give uh, first really a, a working definition. It's not perfect, but at least a working definition, very modest uh, definition. But then I think more importantly, we try to bring together all the elements that should be bring together in order to develop a real space traffic management policy. And this a bit echo uh, the previous panel, where it was said that indeed you need to bring together the uh, engineers, the economists, but as well the lawyers. And uh, basically we have four avenues. The first one is the development or the look for STM requirements on the side of the civil, but the military as well, because it's very important. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the use of space by the military is more and more important. Then the second avenue is really more about the capabilities 
uh, what you can see, how you can see collision avoidance, re-entry, fragmentations, all these elements, involvement of the industry as well, very important. Then the third element is uh, linked to the regulatory part, where we try to look about standards and guidelines. How could we promote more the use of these standards and guidelines? And what is a bit innovative is uh, the willingness eventually to develop some uh, legislation at the EU level uh, in order to tackle the issue of uh, space traffic management. Finally, the fourth avenue is uh, toward the international aspects because of course, uh, if you are trying to tackle this issue only with a national or for us is a regional perspective, this will be useless because space by definition, you don't have borders, though you need to work with uh, everybody on that. And there I think the, the, the most important message is, of course, we are willing to work actively with the UN and we will do it again, but we really have in mind of trying to push for uh, the development of different regional approach, different mm -hmm. hubs, and to make them cooperate. Mm -hmm. In a nutshell, this is what you have. Great, thank you. Then I think there's, there's several interesting details that I'd like to unpack as we go further through the discussion. Um, Artie, I'd like to turn to you. You work with, as I mentioned, you know, dozens of satellite operators in US, Europe, as well as around the world. How do the operators see the situation? Are, 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 they, are they in favor of, of, a, of an international space traffic management system? Do, do they see the current efforts from the US and Europe and other countries as positive? Uh, kind of, in general, how do they view this issue? Definitely. Thank you so much for inviting Jassau to be here today. I'm delighted to be here. Um, absolutely. Jassau members take STM extremely seriously. Um, even if uh, between our 29 operators, we may have differing approaches to how to go about it, but it doesn't mean that any one of them takes it less seriously than the other. Um, I can't comment too much on um, the US position. I don't know enough about it. However, um, I would definitely say that Europe has an extremely important role to play uh, in convening public and private sector um, stakeholders around this. And my view is really that um, being a regional group, I hope that the member states of the European Union can realize um, that they stand before an opportunity and they're not actually hampered by the broader geopolitical differences that prevent consensus at an international level, at global level. Um, and of course we have uh, great activities already going on in the EU with, there's a bunch of studies going on right now. Um, we have the, the ECSS for the European standards, we have the EU SST. Um, and I, I think if member states can, can really pull in the same direction uh, and try to accelerate uh, some of the work that's going on, I think they can make a difference. Um, one of the areas where I think we need the EU to do more is to support fundamental improvements in SSA data collection. Um, whether it's through sensors, whether it's uh, through a broadening of the EU SST uh, and so on. I mean, of the 1,300,000 odd objects which are up to 10 centimeters and above, even the 18th only tracks, I think it's what, 24,000, something like that. So. Um, if, if the EU SST can not limit itself only to European players, if it can strike partnerships with others, and if the European Union can help uh, mobilize more, more funding and so on for additional sensors and so on, I think we, are, we stand a good chance of working towards a multinational system of systems, um, which really uh, combines SSA sensors and the analysis <laughs> capacities um, uh, that fuses data through open interfaces to improve uh, the over overall awareness. But I know you're asking about STM, but I think STM alone is not going to help uh, address the pending crisis. <laughs> uh, and I, 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 I do think we need to remember we are trying to define norms for what is essentially a moving target. And even though you could say, well, with a moving target, you don't know what you need to do, we can work on gaining a better understanding. And I think we need to do that. And again, that's an opportunity for the EU to drive. Um, we need to understand uh, a lot more like how many satellites and systems can safely share LEO 
where are we with respect to that? I, I don't know if it's an easy question to, well, I, I know it's not an easy question to answer, but is it even possible <laughs> the, the to answer that question? The last panel that it's not an easy question exactly. to answer, right? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, still, we should, we should try to have some kind of analysis around that. Um, we, we still don't know what is an appropriate um, uh, uh, post-mission deorbit time frame. Uh, we don't know what the minimum reliability requirements uh, metric should be that satellites should be built to and so on. So I think there's a lot of important work uh, that needs to be prioritized um, so that we can know what norms need to be put in place. Is it best practices? Is it standards? Is it regulations? Uh, and um, how, how effective will those norms then be? Mm -hmm. And I think something I want to come back to later in the discussion is how much of this is voluntary norms versus mandatory rules and, and what is that balance? Because uh, you know, I, I think we're going to find maybe a little bit of both. Um, but I want to pick up on the data question um, and, and turn to you, Brian. Um, you know, you, part of your job at XM Analytic is thinking very deeply about the quality of data, how to improve our knowledge, um, and, and XY Analytic is one of the leaders in doing that for the, the, the deep space geostationary world. Um, how is the conversation going with governments about, you know, their leveraging yours and other commercial capabilities when building these national STM frameworks? I think there was a prudent phrase in the last panel that was, it's complicated. <laughs> um, there's a lot of different equities to represent in terms of standing up a space traffic management function for the government on the civil side. Uh, and I'm not gonna speak toward uh, where they're trying to go. We're really excited to work with uh, where it seems civil uh, space traffic management is going uh, with Richard Dalbello taking the helm now at Department of Commerce. Uh, I think importantly, uh, we've done our best over, you know, since beginning to fly satellites to quote unquote manage space traffic, right? When Charles Lindbergh crossed the Atlantic for the first time. Air traffic control wasn't really a huge driver at the time. There weren't a lot of collisions to worry about. Um, but as that traffic regime grew in complexity, it became a necessary uh, capability. And they went to evolve toward data-driven decision-making uh, to make sure that the updates and the uh, required data to support the questions that are, that are had by the operators uh, was, was readily available. Uh, so I would say that's kind of our role uh, in all of this is to ensure that uh, as we begin to formulate a, a, a new formalism for uh, space traffic management, that it is, again, a, a data-driven decision-making process like any other uh, business process, as uh, one of the panelists, again, previously was talking about the economic drivers, right? How do we enable those economic levers to be pulled by those that are going to be operating in space and how do we enable regulators to be informed so that that dialogue isn't, isn't one-sided or simply a debate of opinion. Uh, so we observe uh, most frequently at GEO, but certainly in all orbit regimes, we have capacity to uh, contribute collection and information uh, to include uh, events in, in LEO, to include recent uh, events that have made the news in GEO and then extensions of those as we're looking at expanding the economy even beyond geo into cislunar space. Uh, we are, uh, you know, dialoguing where it makes sense to kind of interact with uh, the government right now on that, but also with those who would be kind of executing those operations and saying, what do you need mm -hmm. to be successful? And, you know, is it, you know, it, it is useless. You know, I hear about this, rapid exponential growth, even in LEO, or especially in LEO, uh, of the number of space actors, that means you have a, a, an increase in the rate at which you need an update to the information you're receiving. Are you asking for it? Do you know that you need it? Mm -hmm. it is, how does that drive your decision making to achieve safer operations in that evolving regime? And that's going to come to other places in space as, as our activities begin to evolve and expand. And so, again, like that's where we're coming from at ExoAnalytic is to say, how do we bring our technology and our capabilities to provide the infrastructure, to do the data collection, and to provide that data exploitation and a timeliness necessary to support those processes so that they can be done safely and effectively. So that it's not just theory from the research side talking in its own circles, but also an inclusive and diverse discussion that includes everyone that brings something to the table on how to do that correctly. Um, but I think we've reached a time where 
that discussion can't happen if it's not driven by observation and, and by data today. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that's part of what makes this discussion of space traffic management so challenging is A, we have the, the debate over what it means, let alone what to call it. There's the data piece of it. There's the government oversight regulation piece of it. There's the national framework. There's the international coordination. And, and we're sort of trying to figure out what all that looks like in space while we're already using it, right, and flying over the constellations. Um, and so, Marilyn, I wonder if you could pick up there, you know, you've done some work looking at how other domains have addressed traffic management um, and may have tackled some of these same issues. What hope is there? You know, what kind of lessons can we maybe take yeah. from those other domains, right? Sure. So, you know, I think there's lots of different analogies people have looked at, and it's always a, a good way to try to think of solutions and, and see what's out there. The one that I find really useful is looking at the global weather community. Um, and there are kind of four similarities and four areas where I think we can really draw lessons um, from that experience, which goes back more than 100 years. Um, so one is the you know, inherently international nature of this activity. So when you're doing weather monitoring, you really need to have global data, you have global um, forecasts so that you can really understand how the weather affects everything else on the Earth, right? And so all their monitoring, data collection, data sharing, has a, a global element to it, an international element to it. And that's the same for, for space traffic management or space situational awareness. You, the data you collect, the products you're creating, they have value outside of national boundaries. So I think at looking at things like the World Meteorological Organization and the way that the global uh, weather community has coordinated together, that's one way we can uh, learn from that community. Um, I think also looking at how they deal with data. Um, they've had a lot of discussions over decades about what weather data needs to be openly available, what weather data can be sold, uh, what is the, the responsibility from an ethical perspective, from an economic perspective. Uh, and I think we're wrestling with those same issues with space situational awareness and space traffic management. You know, what, what data do we want to make openly available? What are, what's going to be the impact of doing so? Uh, working with the commercial sector, so very closely related to these issues of uh, open data, you know, that's another area where the weather community has decades of experience and, and reports and all sorts of things written about uh, how to do that. And so what we see today is there's a huge uh, value-added commercial weather sector, and that's what we'd like to have uh, in SSA and space traffic management, to have this really active, successful commercial sector, um, but how do we do that, and how do we balance that with the responsibility of the government? So again, I think there are lessons to learn in that area. Uh, and then lastly, the fourth area, I think specifically thinking about warnings. Um, so the weather community, of course, with you know, severe weather warnings, severe weather watches, um, that's something there's lots of experience with, you know, what level of quality do you need for those? What kind of communication capability do you need for that? Um, what are your ethical responsibilities with respect to these, right? We always talk about, you know, this, this back and forth between ethics and, and economics and how you make them work together. You know, we want to have a large commercial sector and you can sell um, severe weather warnings, for example, right? And lots of people would buy them, but we don't do that for ethical reasons, right? We believe that everyone should have access to those, right? And so there are, are things like that that we can translate over to space traffic management as well and thinking about what we want to make available, what these services need to look like, what's the responsibility of government versus commercial, um, all of those types of things. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of possibility there. Yeah, absolutely. I, I like the fact you mentioned weather because all too often we jump to air traffic or we jump something like that. But there are lots of other domains and lots of other examples for that. I think it's a good example for the, 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 the data sharing and commercial prob pub public sector issues. Um, Rodolfo, I want to turn back to you. Uh, when, when, the, when the United States announced Space Policy Directive 3, there was some international concern. This was the U.S. You know, trying to set the rules for everybody else. Um, and when the EU started working on space traffic management, there was some sense that it was framed as trying to come up with an alternative approach to what the U.S. was doing. But as you just talked about and what's in the joint communique, um, there's quite a lot of overlap between the, the, the approaches. So um, I guess the question is, do you see this as an area where countries should be or are trying to be competitive, or is it more of how different regions and countries are just trying to figure out their piece of it and then how to cooperate, right? 
Thank you for the question. I think in, it's very important here <clears throat> to stress that there is no competition in this field among the nation. I mean, uh, of course, uh, what the US is capable today is impressive, and there is nobody can say the contrary on that. We are working definitely with the US on the more technical uh, aspects, with EUSST, for example. And uh, the idea is more an idea of burden sharing, because uh, today uh, you have indeed more or less uh, several thousand satellites, but if uh, the uh, hundred thousands are uh, in the end coming uh, into LEO, uh, and one day uh, we will uh, have more use of LEO, uh, then we will need to have a burden sharing. And I think uh, the idea is more uh, an idea of cooperation. It's why I, I think we are not competing and we should need uh, to cooperate more in order to avoid what? Duplication. Because of course, monitoring space has a cost. And there we need to work together. And this is the idea of uh, this communication. Because basically we are looking for the same aim. Mm -hmm. I think everybody wants to use uh, space in, in order to produce services, to produce for the common goods. Uh, we want as well as a name to, to avoid to, to, to repeat uh, history because uh, this will be another tragedy of another common, basically, uh, space. Uh, I mean, this was announced for environment uh, like 50 years ago and we are repeating that now. Mm -hmm. So we need to work together and the idea as well is with the industry. And I think nobody will dare to say that we can do it without the industry. Without the industry, we will be blind because of the sensors. We need uh, the software, uh, we need the data, we need... So all this is uh, very, very important to us and I guess as well to what I understood to the US. And when you look in the final part of the communication, you see that we are basically saying, let's discuss about it, what can be done. But Indeed, everybody needs to reflect at its level. It could be a nation, it could be a region, because in order to discuss about solution, you need to make sure that you agree about what you are talking about with your own region or nation or agencies. So this is the idea behind. It's why we started this work hands-to-hands -hands with all member states, uh, because, because this communication is a result of a two years discussion with the member state. This is very important to, to stress. Uh, so the idea is to reflect on it, try to develop some aspects, but of course not doing it alone, but doing it think, while thinking that it's necessary one day, and the sooner the better, to act collectively. Mm -hmm. um, and as, and as I pointed out, you know, it took the U.S. the better part of 10 years to come up with what their approach is. So you guys move pretty quick uh, if you're going across the whole European Union. Uh, but just uh, to put another finer point on it, part of this is the collaboration, but part of this is also the oversight framework, right? And that has to be done at a national level in some cases, right? So you're looking at not only what is the sort of the EU approach, but at some point, I think you're gonna be also talking about how each country is gonna be perhaps putting those requirements, norms, standards into their national licensing frameworks, correct? Yes, but I think we can agree to, I would say, minimum rules. I mean, today, if you launch a satellite and you have no collision avoidance, is it normal? I mean, you can compare with the car industry. At the beginning, cars were sold without a belt. It was normal. But nobody cared about security. Today, if you don't wear your belt, at least in most of the countries, not of all the countries, you will get a fine. So this is the same idea. Today, with all what has been said by the previous panel, mm -hmm. uh, they very well explained that we reach a sort of tipping point where we need now to agree on these minimum rules. And I don't see that we have a huge discrepancies on this list of minimum rules. There is even, I, I'm sure, a consensus about it. And indeed, these rules should be minimum and they should be, uh, they should work with what? With a set of standards as well. Uh, so the rules, they don't need 
to develop every single aspect. On the contrary, I mean, we, it would be ridiculous to have a very detailed rule, no, but to set the minimum rules of the game when you go up there. So picking up on that, um, both, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the US approach and, and as we just outlined the EU approach talk about leveraging standards, operator-led practices as the sort of the baseline rules. Um, for, for anybody else, but me, I'll ask Artie to start with, I know she's been involved in some of this. Um, how successful has the private sector been in trying to come to agreement on those baseline standards, uh, rules, norms, um, and are, are there areas where that's going really well and are there areas where we're, we're struggling a bit? So maybe Art, if you want to start and then I'll go to Brian. Industry definitely has the ability and the incentive to um, come up with as whatever best practices and things that it can. And I think the SDA is a great example. I know I always talk about the SDA, but I, I really think it's a great example of what can be achieved uh, when operators come together uh, uh, to, to, you know, following common interests. Um, <clears throat> The good thing about that is that, you know, even though it was private sector led, uh, they managed to win the, the trust and the confidence also of public operators. So that's when you saw NASA, NOAA, UMATSAT, et cetera, also all joining the SDA. But, and it, it has been very successful, but I think, um, you know, yes, it overcame the need for ad hoc coordination. It provided clear points of contact and all of these things. However, it's unclear to me whether this kind of system can really scale up to cope with the mega constellations that are going to be launched without public support. And, um, you know, I think it's a shame that it's always seen as, oh, that was a private sector initiative and we shouldn't just trust the industry. Um, because on some things, like the SDA, you really can. You really can. It has a proven track record and it has consistently increased its membership. But I, and I think that the public sector, like the EU, for example, should really look at that, look at the integrity and the reliability of the data that it has, look at its track record and support it with resources to help it scale up. And I think that's one of the difficulties that lies ahead. Brian? I might come at that question from a slightly different angle. Uh, I think the SDA is a great example of, uh, you know, private sector collaborating on the data side. And so I, I'll leave that where it is. Um, I'd like to mention Confers, which we joined recently, which is uh, dedicated to uh, industry-led efforts in developing standards for on-orbit servicing and maintenance, uh, which the national strategy in the U.S. has come out for in-space assembly, maintenance and manufacturing, or something like that, ISAM. Uh, we have equities in that, in that the information services we provide help ensure the safety and assurance of those types of operations as more ambitious things are being done with spacecraft to include space logistics and stepping into deep orbits and things like that. So uh, we thought it was worth being a part of that dialogue as the industry starts figuring out those things that they want to achieve. Uh, how is it that those information services play a role? Um, so there are the kind of self-serving, it's not quite the right phrase, but the, the, the kind of myopic view of this is what we do and so we should define our standards within our own box for how we should do that best. But there are also the secondary roles of because we do these things and they have a benefit in these other areas, how do we get involved in that discussion so that that cross mm -hmm. uh, interaction is occurring uh, both within industry and, and public operators. Mm -hmm. Um, and just to add to that, so uh, full disclosure, uh, Secure World is involved in this thing called Confers, which is, a, as you mentioned, a consortium of companies doing rendezvous proximity operations, satellite servicing on orbit, and they're trying to develop standards for how to do that. And it's one of these areas where there aren't a lot of existing government frameworks and license frameworks that says this is how you will do this particular operation. So the industry and the governments are trying to figure out what the norms, what the standards should be for those kinds of activities. Uh, and, it's, and it's difficult because there's not a lot of experience. We're talking about you know, refueling satellites. Um, you know, how often has that happened? None, as far as like you know, robotic to robotic refueling. Um, satellites robotically docking to other satellites for life extension? Well, there's two of those examples, right? So, 
it can be challenging to develop the, the standards from that lived experience. And we, we supported both of those examples directly. Um, and so I'll just make the point that, you know, the ones that we advocate for are to the maximum extent practicable, integrate these available information services, whether that's for the training of onboard autonomous contr man and control systems that people are developing today. Uh, there's a lot of uh, promise of technology out there that, you know, hopefully has the opportunity to bring revolutions to this field. Uh, but uh, you know, coming back to that original point of data-driven decision-making as, as we do th things here, uh, you know, we make sure that as we interact with these groups that we're advocating for, for that to be made available so that uh, you know, we aren't trying to kind of fill the gaps with, mm -hmm. with other logic that you know, could be ill-founded. Anything else to add? Yeah, I'll maybe say something. So, you know, I think having industry-led regulation makes a lot of sense in this area, right? There, uh, there's a lot of specialized knowledge. There's a lot to be gained from that experience and being able to leverage that when you're making these regulations. Um, but also to keep in mind, you know, it's not industry-only regulations or industry on its own, right? So I think there really is still an important role for government there to be representing the public, to be representing, you know, the long-term sustainability of space, thinking about, you know, these other equities, right, and, and how they should be represented within this, uh, within this forum. And I think sometimes there's so much specialized knowledge and so much, especially in the U.S., you know, desire to really support the, the commercial industry and its growth um, that we can sometimes lean too far that way. You know, and I, I think, for example, um, the, you know, NASA has this agreement with SpaceX about how they're going to manage uh, conjunctions. And, you know, just, as, you know, reading that agreement, there's a lot of, um, you know, when there's a conjunction, it's really NASA is trusting SpaceX to do those maneuvers, and there's not information in the agreement itself about what the threshold is for that, for example. So it may be that that's being negotiated, you know, on the sidelines, and it's just not in the actual agreement, but I think, you know, as the public, it's important for us to know, you know, what are, you know, when those are the, you know, government uh, taxpayer paid assets, what, what, are, what are we agreeing to there, and what, what are the sort of um, agreements and regulations that are going to govern that activity? So um, the highest voted uh, audience question uh, is the China question. Um, noting that China currently has the second most satellites in orbit, it has several constellations of their own planned, um, and it gets to the question about uh, how countries can work together uh, with, with China, with other, but with other countries, um, both on the data sharing, but also on coming up with these you know, hopefully standardized norms or, or rules for how we're all going to manage traffic together in space. Um, so that's open for anybody who would like to, to you know, address it, to comment on it, uh, because it, it touches on sort of what we hinted at earlier. This is not a problem that any one country can address by themselves. Each country is responsible for their own national activities um, and is going to have to put in place something to oversee them but is going to have to coordinate everybody else. So thoughts, comments on, on, how, on how countries or, or companies we can at least operate together uh, with others? Yeah, I, I just, I'll come at it from the data angle, right? Earlier this year, we reported on the activities of the SJ-21 spacecraft in GEO, uh, removing a defunct navigation satellite, which on its face is uh, actually an outstanding result, right? Removing defunct mass from a very fragile part of uh, the geo ecosystem is, is commendable. Um, doing so with sufficient transparency uh, would make everyone in the global community much more comfortable uh, in terms of being able to communicate, this is what we intend to do, this is the data we're using to support how we're going to get that done. You can go confirm with your own data sources how that's happening. Uh, which is a little bit different with, in terms of supporting the uh, MEV-1 and MEV-2 operations, uh, where that was much more uh, communicated early on and often. Um, but this is something I think the world is learning how to do uh, more effectively uh, today. All sensors have biases and features and <laughs> various things that, you know, you don't trust any of those. It, you don't just trust your onboard GPS, right? You work with third-party pieces of information to make sure everything is operation, operating as expected. Uh, the same kind of things here where if we really mean we're moving towards a transparent you know, data uh, solution here that globally uh, can be uh, ex exploited to support our decision-making, 
then you know it's similar to cyber and, and other domains where uh, you start with the zero trust model and you build the trust up over time. You build it up over use and you start you know letting the policies internal to that system begin to dictate uh, what is reliable uh, sources of information and what is not. But uh, certainly being inclusive of those uh, data sets and uh, providing that opportunity to communicate uh, intent uh, has ramifications in both the civil, military, and industrial spaces. Anyone else? I'd come in on that. I, I mean, I completely agree. I think um, data sharing is one of the, the most obvious uh, uh, areas for countries to participate. Uh, sorry, partner with each other, and we should definitely work to see more of that. And I think, you know, governments, even though it's hard um, to find answers to this, they mustn't stop. They egg each other on. They, 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 they need to continue to show um, that this is a, an absolute priority topic and maintain pressure on each other, but also be a, a model for um, countries which haven't yet become spacefaring nations and tell them that, you know, before you go into this, you need to know that this is something which the international community is looking really seriously at constantly. Um, and uh, it's all, it's really important because that also mobilizes the funding to do some of the research that we, we need to get a handle on to better understand this. But as you said, Brian, ultimately it's down to individual governments, national governments, because they're the only ones who can enforce. Now, I'm not a fan of the race for space or the race for 5G. We work a lot in, on digital, so I, I really dislike that because I think it's just about geopolitical positioning. Um, but when it comes to space sustainability, I wish there was a race, you know, because that's where we really need one. And it's really analogous to climate change. In the absence of it, if, if you allow an operator in your, your uh, jurisdiction to behave irresponsibly, then why should I take care of mine? I mean, it's, it's exactly the same kind of blame game that we see in climate change. But we should be learning the lessons of that because we know where that goes. Mm -hmm. um, so, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, I would just say, with with respect to, to China in particular, I think you know one of the things that gives me hope. You mentioned the you know they have the second most number of objects in space, so they, there's a lot of self interest there, right? In creating a sustainable environment and in creating something where we can make sure we're operating safely over a long period of time. Um, I think one of the things that for me and and hopefully for the broader community demonstrated the need for more data transparency and and coordination on the international level was this in, uh, interaction between the US and China that happened um, at kind of the, the turn of the year around December, January this past year, um, where China had provided a note verbal to the, the United Nations saying that there was a close approach of a Starlink satellite near their uh, human tended station. Uh, the US then responded, I think a month or two later, with a, a note verbal also saying, um, no, there wasn't, basically, right? That they didn't think the close approach had, had happened. Uh -huh. uh, and I think, you know, maybe there's certainly some political element happening there as well, right? But I think a, a big piece of that could be just different data sets and different algorithms, right? And different ways of determining what counts as a close approach. And I think hopefully that helps to illuminate for people, uh, you know, a concrete example of why we need to have better data sharing, better data transparency, so we are on the same page about where these risks are happening and where they aren't. Because we've seen that happen between you know, commercial operators, right, where uh, there was a fascinating incident between two operators about a year and a half ago, uh, and there were four different data providers in the discussion. All four had a different estimate of the collision probability, um, and all four of those estimates changed over the course of the three or four days leading up to the actual close approach. Um, so then you factor in different levels of risk and, and it makes it very difficult to have a, a unified picture, right? Which is why the discussion. Rudolf? Yeah, indeed. And this is, uh, I mean, uh, with the example that we have at the EU level with EU SST, just to merge the data of 40 different sensors, uh, you need to calibrate, you need to have the same quality, you need. It's a huge work. And I think where we can work, we can work with uh, the other nations in two ways. First, at the technical level, meaning the standardization bodies, in order indeed to qualify what is a data with a certain quality, uh, which type of data, if it's coming from telescope, a radar, laser, all these are elements are very technical and I think everybody can work on mm -hmm. it. And on the other side is why we really think that, of course, the best option would be a UN approach, but 
due to the fact that STM touch as well to the involvement of some military uh, sensors and has some eco in as a strategic element, it seems difficult today. Uh, so this regional approach is one possibility. Like we have actually uh, something forming similar uh, with uh, space weather, mm -hmm. with ICAO, with this regional approach, uh, trying to have regional centers. Mm -hmm. Why not? Mm -hmm. Brian, can I just come in here? I, I mean, from an operator perspective, the last thing that any operator wants, whether it's to do with spectrum, whether it's to do with different regulation, is a patchwork of different norms. Yet at the same time, you know, as Rodolf just said, we, we can't wait for uh, you know, a harmonized international uh, level framework to be put in place. So what, what is the view we should take, that a patchwork of norms is, is not a good thing, or that in fact collectively all the different rules and best practices and whatever comes into place is going to actually move the needle. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, yeah. I think there's a way industry contributes to that actually in that, you know, one of the practices, I won't necessarily debate whether or not it's a standard at this, this point, is to demonstrate your awareness that you've derived from your data. Mm -hmm. Just demonstrating what you do have in a open and potentially international forum allows you to lay your data set next to someone else and say, where do we agree? Where do we have discrepancies? Is that an uncertainty in your process? Is that an uncertainty in my process? How do we account for that? And continuously having that dialogue. Uh, so it's one of those things where, uh, you know, if you wait for the top-down consensus-driven kind of state-level international processes to produce the product, you will probably wait a long time um, based on lots of contributing factors to that. If you also do the bottom-up approach of what can we derive from the data, what can we conclude and put in front of our respective countries that is irrefutable, mm -hmm. just from a data perspective, that will at least inform that dialogue as the uh, international and other uh, policy discussions are being had. And I'll just point out that if your answer is, well, I have no uncertainty in my data, you've got a problem because you, absurd, you assuredly have some uncertainty, and you better understand that before you can go talking to other entities. Um, Rodolfo, there's a question here for you. Um, when the European Commission talks about standards, um, how are you defining that term? Is you talking about technical design standards? Are you talking about standards of be operational behavior? Can you talk a little bit about, about how you're approaching that? For us, uh, a standard is coming from an standardization body. So it, it can be ISO, of course, at the international level, or at the different, at the regional level for Europe would be the SEN Senelec, for example. So what we call standards is really uh, by recognized standardization body. And I think today uh, in space, you have a lot of guidelines, very good one, in the, the 21 LTS guidelines. It's a beautiful piece of work. Huh? It, it's impressive. Uh, the IIDC produce as well some guidelines, uh, you have some standards, but at one stage you need to, to have indeed uh, perhaps uh, some binding rules in addition to these rules. Uh, and this is what we are looking for, we are just at the beginning and we will launch of course a process of discussing with member states but as well with industry because this STM communication was built on several studies where we involve, of course, industry, because once again, without the industry, there is no STM. Mm -hmm. um, and, and from my reading of the communique, at least at this stage, the European Commission is not looking to implement r regulatory rules for operations, but you are considering regulatory measures to incentivize behavior. Is that, is that my is that understanding of it? Yeah, you, you have. In fact, two elements. The, the, the first one is to say, well, for companies who, which are following these standards, because of course a standard per definition is non-compulsory. Ah, you can decide to follow it or not. And then for the companies following the guidelines. I mean, today, why a company will do that? Uh, well, you have what, what is called in other field the Californian effect, which is, of course, <laughs> you can sell to your investor or to your customer, I am protecting space sustainability. Is it working or not? For consumers, perhaps. Uh, for investors, maybe. Uh, if you have, because you have a race for this, uh, of course, looking for money. Yeah? 
So uh, the idea, what we have in mind is to find ways in order to yeah, give a bonus to these uh, good players. Why we should not find a way to give a bonus, to find a way to incentivize exactly uh, and to say to the good people of the class, yes, you, you, you are playing by these non-binding rules, which are rules in order to have tomorrow the possibility to use space, so you need to, to have a bonus. On the other side, uh, if I think if the communication had stopped there, it would have been already very good, but you need as well to develop some, as I said, basic rules, at least now. We, we reach this turning point where we need to have these basic, basic rules. Gotcha. Um, Brian, there's a question here about the business case uh, for commercialization of space traffic coordination, management awareness. Um, I'll frame it a couple of ways. One, we are talking about analogies earlier. In the air world, there are countries who have chosen to privatize air traffic management. Canada's one example. Um, Mario mentioned earlier, there's also the weather world where there's both publicly provided data, but also commercial data and, and you know, paid for commercial analytical solutions. How does that inform how you guys are thinking about the, the commercial model for what might be SSA or STM? Yeah, I might take your point about a patchwork of regulations and strategies. A, a patchwork of approaches, is, it makes planning difficult, right? Um, certainly going private in this way and challenging industry to bring the information services to bear is an option, but it's ultimately up to governments how they're going to consume and, and ultimately employ this information to regulate the operation of space systems. So I'd say our approach is by just necessity uh, varied um, to reflect those signals that we're getting from both our government and our, our commercial customers. The degree to which what we can do can directly affect the success or failure of on-orbit operations of private systems, there is a commercial business case for that. The degree to which that now supports all of this broader discussion uh, requires us to figure out uh, and maintain a dialogue with our government customers. What do you believe is inherently governmental? What do you reserve for within your uh, approved roles for being able to go do this? And then where is it that we can uh, bring data and information to bear uh, to support your um, process and decision making? Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes that also, the, you know, we have a part of our business with an exoanalytic that does do studies. Right, we will go do modeling and simulation. We have digital engineering technology. We'll go do those things. But I will say, um, you know, I kind of have this uh, visceral reaction that lately to the word just study in general because it usually means let's kick the can for a year and a half, and and you know go talk to everybody who does this for another year. I, I will tell you um, our perspective, um, paraphrasing in my own words here would be. You know, a, 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 data, a data set derived from a carefully derived experiment is worth its weight in, in a thousand studies, right? Mm. Learn by doing, mm. right? You should be able to study the problem by, by executing operations, by actually exercising the processes which we, care, we, we claim to be researching. Uh, I, I, all too often I see that approach of you know, we'll, we'll learn about it some more this year and maybe next year we'll go do some things. And, you know, there are going to be economic consequences mm -hmm. to taking that approach long term. Uh, so I would just advocate, I hope that we move to a paradigm very quickly where when we say study, what we really mean is let's get the data together. Let's get the right people in this very diverse conversation in a room and go figure out what, how we need to do this and, and learn it by doing it together. Mm -hmm. I would just add on the commercial uh, question, there's always a cost associated with this. Um, even, you know, those companies are, or entities which are members of SDA pay for the service. Now, of course, industry might be better placed to provide more data and a better service than what is currently freely available. But um, as I said, to scale that up, it needs more resources. Uh, it, Rodolphe explained the complexity of this, right? Um, and it mustn't come to a point where there's where cost becomes a barrier to sharing data or sharing information. Or, or to operating responsibly and safely, right? I and mean, that's ultimately the goal, <laughs> to be able to do that. Um, Meryl, there's a question here. We, we, you, we talked a little bit about analogy other domains. There's a question here specifically, what can be learned 
from what ICAO is done, doing how they've evolved, International Maritime Organization. So anything else you want to add in about, you know, lessons from the maritime and, and air domains for space? Yeah, well, I'll say I'm not an expert in, in ICAO and, and um, the processes there. I mean, I think there certainly are lessons to be learned from, from both those areas, from maritime and from air. Um, but I think one of the things we have to be careful with, you know, with the mention of ICAO, for example, is, and this applies actually in weather, right? I mentioned the, the World Meteor Meteorological Organization. In those cases, we had representatives nationally that were pretty clear, you know, this is the head of the agency that monitors weather for the nation. This is the head of the agency that deals with air traffic, right? That we could then send to an international body to, to represent each of the national positions and, and kind of move forward. Um, and I don't know that we really have that um, in space traffic management. You know, if you think about where, who is the individual, you know, at that country who is the clear leader of, of those activities, a lot of times they're spread out in different places, right? Or they're kind of buried within other organizations. Or undefined in, in a lot of countries, right? Or undefined, right? And so I think that, you know, just as a starting place of how do you come together internationally, how do you organize, I think is a challenge that we have not yet um, addressed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Plus also the challenge of, you know, airspace, there are some national airspace boundaries and maritime, we have, you know, sovereignty in, on, the, on parts of the oceans. We don't, mm -hmm. that's an issue for the space world. So um, we're down to the last couple of minutes here. Um, I'm gonna give each, each of you uh, a chance to very briefly, uh, as, as, the, as the European uh, Union, as the United States, as other countries are thinking about this from the national level and putting together stuff, what would your sort of one piece of advice be that they should be doing in the near term uh, to help get towards what we all have been talking about, sort of this, this coherent framework for how everyone can operate in space? Um, so I think I'll start on this end. Rodolphe, uh, any, any sort of thing that pops out is you know, what, is the, what is the real priority to focus on sort of in the very near term? Well, I, I think we uh, need to start discussing really on this perhaps minimum rules that we could agree. Uh, but once again, respecting each other because we have a different approach, we have different paths, we have, and indeed, even if STM is not new in itself, uh, is due to the new developments and the increased number of satellites that now it becomes a reality and a, a need, but the idea would be really that we, we need to discuss and we, we have the chance to have uh, at the COPUOS uh, a special working group which has been established in order to look for the implementation of the 21 LTS guideline, for example. This is a good place where indeed we try to find an answer to exactly what you said, to, to whom we could, we could talk about. Mm -hmm. so. gotcha. Mariel? Yeah, I would say, you know, we need to move forward in parallel paths. So we've had some of this discussion about international first or national first. I think they've got to both happen. We don't have time to, to um, do one before the other. Uh, so I think in the U.S., we need to get this transition to civil uh, happening so that, that can really, um, you know, get rolling, start providing, you know, figure out how they're going to provide data, what kind of data they can provide, how they're going to interact with the international community. So we need that on the, the U.S. national side. And then on the international side, I think a priority is, you know, figuring out even the, the process to have this coordination and really improve that transparency in the near term. So I think these issues of who needs to be at the table, um, what can we actually do to improve transparency? Because I think it's such a pressing issue and it is, you know, a precursor to really being able to have space traffic management uh, mm -hmm. agreements. The gentleman from Viasat on the previous panel made an excellent point about requirements and the way we do things being derived for, the, for a different time in the past. And I think doubling down on that, doing our own form with, with our all different equities involved, the market research of what actually is our requirement today? What do I need for my information services? What do I need for my government to tell me in order to support my missions? What value does that have for me? What risk might that mitigate for me? How does that support my decision-making processes? Are my updates rates now faster than they would have been before? Uh, and do the, the way that they're being published today meet my needs? And if there are gaps, then we can have clear demand signals for needing to go scale in the right places. Um, simply concluding that the way we've always done things will scale 
in order to keep pace with the way, it, it was called out in SPD3 that that was already a failed strategy, mm -hmm. right? So doing that, uh, doing that analysis today and coming out with a, with a clear message to our respective bodies that are, that are trying to figure this out, I think it's probably going to drive uh, a lot of meaningful uh, vision for how to address this problem for today. Hardy? I think, um, you know, we, we talked a lot about data sharing and when we, when we talk about that, you're, you're basically just talking about how do we deal with the problem that exists the, the point is we need to, to help prevent the problem being exacerbated. So, I mean, prevention is far better than cure. So I really think we need to invest, in, invest more in trying to answer some of the open questions out there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, you know, it's, it's all very well saying we need to change rules. But, for example, if I make an analogy with what the European Commission did, Rodolphe, don't take this personally, it wasn't DG Deficits, DG Connect. But in the field of digital, in 2013, they said basic broadband for all. By 2020, it had to be 50 megabit per second for all. By 2025, it's 100. And by 2030, now it's gigabit connectivity for all. We've still got a digital divide. I mean, so when you bring that back to space sustainability, you've got your 25-year rule. We know it's too long. But we can't even achieve that. So is changing it going to help? Maybe. Maybe it puts more pressure. Maybe it, it sends a signal that drives change. I don't know. But I think we need to invest a lot more into answering some of the open questions so that we start working more on prevention rather than cure. That's great. Thank you. Well, um, please join me in thanking my panelists uh, for having this.